Um, I'm really happy to be joining this conversation about upending the status quo and essentially reinventing the world. And it's great to be in Chicago because many, many things happened in Chicago, but it's great to be celebrating Chicago Ideas Week this week because next Thursday marks a significant anniversary for one idea that came to life only five miles from this spot. 120 years ago in a small building on Quincy Street, now in the shadow of the Willis Tower, a crowd gathered to eavesdrop on the most extraordinary thing, a long distance phone call. Not long before, Alexander Graham Bell told his investors that he had invented something that would allow someone in New York to speak to someone in the Windy City. His investors said, really? What would they have to talk about? What indeed. <laughs> Connecting New York with Chicago was the longest telephone cord in the world. Two copper wires that were strung from pole to pole linking the AT&T office in Lower Manhattan through Harrisburg and Pittsburgh and South Bend to right here on Quincy Street. And then it happened, the call connected, and the world forever changed. But here's the thing, the disruption wasn't the telephone. A new invention, sure, but it might have been relegated to merely a parlor trick, but for the system that made the telephone usable and universal a network of phone lines crisscrossing the nation and then circling the globe. Electric storage and transmission methods that transformed threads of copper into webs of human relationships. Now imagine the context, it's 1902. People are still getting around in the horse and buggy. Agriculture was the largest industry in America. Against this turn of the century backdrop, comes a truly earth-shattering innovation, the idea of transcontinental communication, the idea of sharing information across vast distances at only a moment's notice, the idea of virtual interaction. They disrupted the way Americans talked and traded. They disrupted the way Americans saw themselves and their ties to one another. They disrupted family dinners for 120 years and counting and they could well disrupt this talk with a single Beyonce ringtone, so I hope you have your phones off. But not all ideas are created equal and not all ideas create equally disruptive innovations. Simply put, new isn't enough. Disruptive innovation comes from ideas that shatter status quo thinking, and Steve and Rick talked amazingly about some of them. You may have heard the quote from the late, great George Carlin, who insightfully observed, in fact, the status quo sucks. Well, I could go a step further by saying maybe it's status quo thinking, to use a more delicate phrase that isn't good. That's why for the past century, Rockefeller's been committed to radical disruptive ideas that upend conventional thinking. Here's one of my favorites, which is rather appropriate for dinner time. It's called scuba rice, and with this innovation, we didn't just break the status quo, we submerged it. As rising sea levels and rain-induced flooding hit developing countries, we're witnessing a 15% drop in rice production. The implications of this drop will be catastrophic, especially across Asia. So naturally, countries are stockpiling rice reserves and they're changing markets worldwide. They're spending untold billions on levees to keep the floods out. But then researchers at the Rockefeller-supported International Rice Research Institute called IRI had a cra crazy idea. What if we just let the rice drown? It was a thought so disruptive that it rippled through rice paddies the world over. Erie, with a number of global research partners, identified a wild research strain in India that was highly resistant to flooding. But the resistant strain had low nutritional yields. So the geneticists worked to crossbreed many, many rice varieties, and the result was a highly nutritious rice whose roots hibernate during flooding, allowing them to withstand complete submergence for up to 20 days. Scuba rice is now being distributed across Asia and soon will be moving to Africa. Watching the waterlogged plants yield new sustenance, one farmer said, this rice is like magic, but we call it disruptive innovation. 
Or take another example, moving from food to finance. We know the world has trillions of dollars of needs, of pressing social problems, but only billions of dollars in assets that come from governments or foundations or other sources to help meet them. Some might say that's a reason to be hopelessly pessimistic, but we say think again, because there is enough money. It's just locked in private investments. So the disruptive idea is this. Let's leverage the capital markets to solve a slew of social challenges and underfunded public works. We call it impact investing, and it's a new field of finance that we're helping to build from the ground up. For the last five years, we've been helping to lay a foundation with our colleagues at the Omidyar Foundation and others to build the standards and platforms and exchanges that will enable impact investors to trade for multiple bottom line returns. In other words, for investments that pay both financial and either social or environmental returns, and it is already paying off. Last year, a JP Morgan report revealed that impact investments had doubled over just a single year to approximately 2,200 investments already worth $4.4 billion. It's projected that this industry could grow to a half a trillion dollars within the decade. We think these, in, these investments will have transformative potential, but the transformation will occur first and foremost because of the disruptive idea, the idea that free market capitalism can and must contribute to pressing social problems and to solving them. The invisible hand, this time lending a helping hand. Another game-changing innovation that we've been helping to pioneer, rooted in the same disruptive idea, are social impact bonds. These bonds are sold to private investors. They pay out based on the performance of proven, effective interventions for pressing social needs. The programs save the government enough money to repay investors down the line. And because investors are repaid only if the program succeeds, the social impact bonds allow cash-strapped governments to experiment with evidence-based, outcomes-driven solutions to social challenges without putting taxpayers' money at risk. The first social impact bond, as you can see, was developed for the UK's Peterborough prison. It was a program for reducing recidivism in adult males who repeatedly call, um, are coming to prison over and over again, are reoffending at very high rates. Recently, Mayor Bloomberg announced that Goldman Sachs will provide $10 million in loans to implement a similar program for Rikers Island, where almost half the inmates are reincarcerated within a year. And the Obama administration has proposed more than $100 million in funds to encourage states to innovate using social impact bonds. These bonds address not only recidivism, they can address everything from dropout rates to homelessness. They're filled with the disruptive promise of entirely new networks and entirely new partnerships between public service and private investment. Which brings me back to the rather disruptive idea of 120 years ago here in Chicago. In October of 1892, Scientific Americans summed up the impact of AT&T's first long distance phone call with these words. It is a remarkable achievement, the editors wrote, indicative of marvelous possibilities in the future, but an art still in its infancy. I think the same might be said of our work during our next century at Rockefeller as throughout our last one. It will not be the inventions per se that strengthen the resilience of our communities or improve the lives of poor or vulnerable people around the world. It will be disruptive ideas, the kinds we're talking about tonight, and the innovations they give birth to that will turn our ambitions to accomplishments. I am really looking forward to how that looks. Thank you.